and we're going to look at Joshua and how Joshua was preparing to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River. And so we're looking at chapter 3, verse uh, 6, through chapter 4, verse 7. Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of all of the people. So, that, so they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Jurassites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap, a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabid, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan... The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Joshua had instructed the Israelites to set up a memorial, a monument, so to speak, of 12 stones so that the children who would come after them would know what had happened that day. Now, have you ever thought about some of the monuments that we today still have that mark our history and our lives? Monuments such as the Washington Monument that was built as a tribute to George Washington for his military leadership during the American Revolution. Or how about the Lincoln Memorial that was built in 1922 in honor of Abraham Lincoln as a way to heal the nation after the Civil War over the issue of slavery. Both of these monuments are located in Washington, D.C. But what about the monuments dotted around the town of Gettysburg that will forever tell the story that once took place there so long ago? Not only the stone monuments of soldiers and horses and leaders, but stone monuments marking the graves of those who had given their lives in one of the most famous and bloodiest battles of the Civil War. 
But you know, we don't have to go to Washington, D.C. or even to Gettysburg to see our history and the monuments that have affected our lives. We have only to go to the cemetery and to look at the stone monuments that mark the lives of friends and loved ones that have touched and impacted our lives. We have only to take a drive past one of the many cemeteries and look at all of those monuments lined up neat and orderly in a row, each monument representing a life that someone had lived. Perhaps if we took the time to walk among those stone monuments, we would see that some of those people had lived to a ripe old age while others had died young before really having a chance to have lived. But even so, each monument still marking a season and time when that person was here. Each monument representing a person who at one time lived and who had a family. A person who had touched other people's lives as they had lived theirs. Whether for the good or the bad, they had been someone who had done all of the mundane things that we all do in life. Perhaps they had gone to school, gotten married, raised a family. Chances are they had worked at some kind of a job, shopped for groceries, probably did any number of other tedious things that seemed to fill up our days. Because those are the things that make up our lives and make up us. But each and every person buried beneath their stone monument had in their own way touched the lives of others while they lived. Today on this Memorial Sunday, we come together to remember and to celebrate all the lives that have touched ours. All the lives that are represented in and around the cemeteries in our country. We come together today especially to remember those who gave their lives for us so that we might have the freedom that we enjoy today. But let us never forget that one day there will come a time when our children and our grandchildren, maybe even our great-grandchildren, will stand in a cemetery remembering those who had gone on before them, knowing that they will be remembering us. But the important thing is what they will remember. What will your children and grandchildren pass on to their future generations about you one day? You know, I'll be honest, if you've ever uh, driven down Hill Valley, um, like from Three Springs into Mount Union, there's a street that has a, a stone wall that goes up. It's called Van Devener Street, and that's where I was uh, raised. And it's very close to the cemetery there in Mount Union. And so a lot of times, just for something to do, I would go over and I would walk around and look at the many different monuments I love to see how different each one was, just as different as the people who they represented. I'd read the dates, showing the date of their birth and the date of their death, and it would help me to figure out whether they were young or old. Sometimes you would see pictures engraved on some of those stone monuments of the person's home or their farm or some other item that they cherished while they lived. Sometimes I would feel especially lucky if I came across a stone monument that had a little picture of the person encased on it, and I would truly be able to see what the person had looked like when they lived. So you can imagine how easy it would have been to spend hours just uh, imagining, imagining the kind of life that person may have lived spending hours meandering around the cemetery, wondering about the people that those monuments represented, wondering things like what was their personality? What did they do for a living? Were they a loving person? Did they have children or grandchildren who still miss them not being here? Did they attend a church, and if so, did they truly know Jesus? And was their life one that was lived for him, or was theirs a life lost in unbelief? 
and most of all wondering how their life might have touched and influenced others while they were alive. You know, in our scripture today from Joshua, this is after the Israelites have already been brought out of Egypt by God, led by Moses. They had already spent the last 40 years roaming around in the desert until the original generation had died, including Moses. And now we see that Joshua is their leader and he is about to lead them into the promised land that God had prepared for them. But to get to the promised land, they had to first cross the Jordan River. And so Joshua has prepared and made ready to lead these people across the Jordan River, much like Moses had led the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea. At that time, God had parted the Red Sea and Moses had led the people across on a dry riverbed. But the Jordan River, we are told, is high and running fast. In fact, I looked it up this morning. It said that it can, during its flood stage, it can be as wide as 90 to 100 feet across and as deep as 12 feet You see, it is the flood season, and so the Jordan River is ready to overflow its banks. But this is not going to stop the Israelites from crossing. Joshua has positioned the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant at the very front. And as they prepare to cross, all they do is step their foot into the Jordan River and the water automatically stops flowing. Once again, God's people cross through deep water on dry ground, just as their parents had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. And so now this generation does the same. Once again, God has proven his faithfulness to these people. This was during a time of the year when, as I said, the river would have been high and swollen, even to the point of flooding, and yet not one person got wet. Now, as the priests step into the Jordan River and the water ceases to flow, they stop and stand in the middle of this dry riverbed while all the people cross by in front of them into the promised land. Then the Lord instructed Joshua, as we heard, to get a representative from each of the 12 tribes and to have them gather a huge stone from the river bottom and carry those stones out and arrange them on the edge of the riverbank to form a monument. Now this seems like a very odd thing to do. They could have just gathered up rocks from along the edge of the river without having to carry them out from the bottom of the riverbed. But the people, they do it, and they, but they still question Joshua as to why they did it because they don't quite understand what God is having them do and why they have to do such a thing. But Joshua says, this is so that our children who will come after us will see these stones and they will say, what are these stones here for? And we will have an opportunity to tell them the story of God's faithfulness to us and how he protected and led us out of bondage in Egypt to this new land and this new life that we have now. So we will have an opportunity to tell our children the story of God's faithfulness. Have you told your children and grandchildren the story of God's faithfulness to you? You see, one day you won't be able to tell them. For one day, all they will have is a stone monument in the cemetery. And what kind of a story will that monument tell them? You see, for each of our monuments will tell a story about the way that we lived our lives and the way that we loved and hopefully it will remind those who are coming along after us of God's faithfulness to us. Hopefully those who are left behind will see God through the way we were living and then when we are gone, hopefully our monument will testify to God's faithfulness to us during our life. You know, each monument can represent an example of a life lived for Christ and an example of the protection and guidance that God provided while on our journey from the bondage of sin to the new life we we have found in Christ and the journey that we have taken into the new land flowing with milk and honey 
that we will have in heaven. Just as those 12 stones told a story to the future generations, our stone one day will tell a story. When people see it, will they remember that we followed God during our lifetime? Will they recall that we were faithful Christians who leaned on Christ during the hard times that we went through? Will they say that we represented Christ to others while we were here? And most importantly, will there be others who were led to Christ by our life and our witness? Will our monument be a reminder to our children and grandchildren and even our great-grandchildren of God's faithfulness? just as those 12 stones did next to the bank of the Jordan River. It's important to ask ourselves now while we are living, what will our monument stand for when we are gone? What will the future generations think when they see it? Are there things that we need to change now in our life before a stone monument is all that is left of our life. You know, stones have been used throughout the ages as memorials. They have been used as a way of helping future generations remember what went before them. We are lucky to live close to Washington, D.C. and the Gettysburg battlefields, two important places that we can visit and learn what had happened in the past to us, to make us and our country what we are today. We can look at the monuments that were built in these places by our ancestors so that when we look at them and ask, why are they there? Someone can tell us the story of what they stand for and how they were built so that we will remember our past and what has gone on before us. You see, we are a forgetful people. We often forget from one time to another what God has done for us, and the faithfulness that he has shown us. And if we are prone to forget so easily, how will the message get out to the future generations? How will those generations not yet born hear of our God? Often our witness is not so much with our mouth or our words, but it is with our lives as they are being lived out. What are they learning from you today? What example are you setting for the next generation to follow? When you're gone, will they have the knowledge of the things that they need to get through life? Will they have the knowledge of Jesus and know how to get and have eternal life? We should be living our lives as a monument to Christ. We should be leaving information and stones as if they were monuments along the road of life for our children to follow. For them to see and to hear and to remember what God has done for us, their ancestors, and what God can and wants to do for them. Where are our monuments for our children to follow? King David in Psalms 22 said, for the Lord is king and rules the nations, both proud and humble alike. All who are mortal, born to die, shall worship him, and our children too shall serve him, for they shall hear from us about the wonders of the Lord. Generations yet unborn shall hear of all the miracles he did for us. Are our children hearing it from us? If not, they should be. This is the only way they will learn of God. The only way that they will know our God and the only way that they will be able to follow us into eternity. We don't want them to lose their way. We want that none of our children shall perish. So let us build them monuments so that they can follow and so that when that day comes when we are no longer able to build them monuments that our final stone monument will stand as a constant reminder for the future generations to follow should they ever forget. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are 
our God of ages past and you are our hope to come. We offer our gratitude for all of those who have gone before us, who have taught us and who left monuments for us to follow, who have told us the stories of your faithfulness so that we may find our way here today. Empower us now to do the same. Today, as we honor the past, give us your wisdom to lead the next generation of believers into the future. Help us to live as your people so that our lives may be a testimony of your faithfulness and a monument that leads others on a pathway to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.